It's Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He's risen indeed. You see, he's not on the cross. He is not in the grave. He's not even in the air. He is in the heavens. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of grace. And because he is seated in the heavenlies, you and I are as well if we know him. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about what that empty cross reveals. Just before we do, let me just approach the throne of grace in prayer. Father, we, we come boldly before you this morning, Lord, and the desire of our heart, the cry of our heart is that we would hear from you, that would it would be your word that we hear, that you speak. Word of God, speak, let it fall down like rain. We thank you for this time that we can celebrate the resurrection. And Lord, we thank you for all that that means. So have your way in each one of us today. And I pray that you begin with me. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. In 1899, there was a little girl born by the name of Lyndon. Lyndon was the apple of her father's eye. She loved him and he loved her. Her father was a very prominent man. He was a bank manager in that day and time. To be a bank manager meant that you had a great deal of prominence. But the tragic thing was that he was a chronic alcoholic. And it finally caught up with him. And when it did, he lost his job. He lost his position. And with it, he lost a great deal of his self-respect. He nearly lost his wife and his three little girls. And, and Lyndon, as sometimes children will do, began to make up stories that she would tell her younger sisters. You see, in some way, some children are able to make up stories, make up fantasies, if you will, that help them cope with the chaos that, that happened in their lives. Well, she made up this story of a lady who came to their house and turned everything around. This lady came and changed that which was unchangeable. She came and she repaired what one would think would be irreparable. And, you know, you would think that, that things would have gotten better, but they didn't. When Lyndon was eight years old, her father died of tuberculosis. He died and, and things just went downhill from there. Yet she continued to tell her sisters about this lady who blew in on an east wind and made their home a very happy home. You know, you don't know her as Lyndon. You know her as Pamela Travers, P.L. Travers. And the lady who blew in was Mary Poppins. P.L. Travers kept that alive through her entire life. In 96 years, she kept hoping and hoping beyond hope that something would happen in her life that would change that which is unchangeable. Something that would come along that would reverse the irreversible and redeem the unredeemable. In fact, what you probably don't know about P.L. Travers is that she spent two different periods of time in the States, in, in North America, living with both the Navajo and the Hopi Indians. She wanted to learn about their folklore, their, their, their religious um, beliefs, and, and their entire um, shamanism uh, that, that, that they were uh, so much a part, that was so much a part of them, their religion. She was looking for something that could change that unchangeable in her life. And when her search didn't work out here in the West, she headed off to the East. And, and she went from the sweat lodges here in the West to the Zen masters in the East. She went to Japan and, and, and just looking for something that would change that unchangeable in her life. Her life was a wreck. It was full of hurt. It was full of trouble. It was full of disillusionment. 
And she was sure that there was something that she could find that would, would change, something that would blow in and change her life. But she never found it. In fact, it's incredible because in an interview with her grandchildren, not too long ago, her grandchildren said that she died having never loved anyone and, and feeling that she was never loved. She had looked everywhere for love. She looked everywhere except to the cross. And, and I don't know where you are today, and maybe you're dealing with some very difficult situations and you're looking for something as well, something that can change the unchangeable and reverse the irreversible. Well, is there anything out there? You bet, you bet. Indeed, there is. I want to take you to a passage of Scripture this morning that we wouldn't normally turn to on an Easter Sunday morning. I got to tell you, I was really, really thinking that I was going to be sharing from Matthew 27 this morning, and the Lord took me on a different journey as I, as I began to seek him about what he would have me share I want us to turn to Galatians chapter 3 because Paul is going to quote from the Old Testament. He's going to quote Deuteronomy 21. And I'm going to bring you there in a minute. But first of all, we want to turn to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. I'm only going to, to look at one verse today, but it's probably going to take about 26 verses to get there. But I want us to look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 where Paul writes and he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And maybe you're hearing me today on this Easter Sunday and, and maybe you're looking for something. Maybe you're, you're thinking that, that there has to be something that, that can change the unchangeable. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you that there is, there really is, the answer is it can be found. We need to understand, you see, that he became sacrificially what we were actually so that he could be with us eternally. Now that's good stuff. Let me say it again. He became sacrificially what we were actually so that he could save us eternally. Let's look at what the cross reveals today. And the first thing I want us to see is that the cross reveals the curse of sin. That's the first thing this verse says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Now, remember, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 21. So put your finger there in Galatians chapter 3 and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Let me give you a little bit of context about this. Why in the world would Moses, 1,600 years before Christ was born, be talking about a man hanging on a tree? Well, while you're looking up Deuteronomy chapter 21, I want to tell you something first. I want, to, I want you to know that, uh, th that sin does something. We never think about this, but listen to this. Sin blinds every one of us to the existence of sin itself. Did you get that? It blinds us to itself. It, sin blinds us to sin itself. And when we look at this and, and look at this verse, there, there, there's something that, that, that just becomes so apparent. And, and I want to take us on a little bit of a rabbit trail. A friend of mine posted something a week or so ago, and, and I saw it, and I thought, oh, my, that, that is so, so true. You see, sin blinds us to itself, and, and it's brought us to the point where if you call anything sin, then that's sin. 
I mean, it's a sin to call anything sin. In our day and time, sin is when we call something sin. But the reality is that, it, you know, the world says it's not an affair, or, or the, rather the world says it's an affair, but in reality, it's adultery. It's, it's not safe sex, it's fornication. It's, it's not gay love, it's sodomy. It's not pro-choice, it's murder. It, it's not a fib, it's a lie. You see, sin blinds us to its extent. You see, it'll take us further than we would ever want to go. And it blinds us to its expense because it always ends up costing us more than we would ever want to pay. But now let me get back to the text. That was a rabbit trail. But it was all for free. But what was Moses doing when he was talking about a cross 1,600 years before the birth of Jesus Christ? Well, in Deuteronomy 21, Moses is giving out the law a second time. And he's doing it because the first time it was given out was to a generation of people that wouldn't go in to the promised land. So this is a second generation. This is another generation that's going to go into the promised land. And so Moses is giving the law twice, hence the name Deuteronomy. But now look at this, Deuteronomy 21, beginning in verse 22. It says, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he's put to death, and you hear him, or I'm sorry, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on that tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed to God. Now, Understand, God has never told anyone to hang someone to put them to death. This is after they're dead. Now let me tell you what, he, what, what it's saying here. When a man has done something, when he's committed a sin that's deserving of death, he's judged and, and, and that judgment has fallen on him. You can put him in a tree. He's been put to death. You put him in a tree just for a few hours and it's to remind everyone and anyone who sees him of the curse of sin on a human life. Now, that happened three times in the Old Testament and we like to talk and think that, you know, there were three crosses in the New Testament but actually that happened three times in the Old as well. Let me give them to you. Joshua chapter 10. I told you I was going to get you to 26 verses. Joshua chapter 10. Joshua had led the children of Israel into the promised land. And there were enemies that had risen up when they got there. There were five kings and, and five armies that had risen. Isn't it interesting that the world will band together and come against God, come against the people of God? Now, this is a very familiar passage in, Jap in Joshua chapter 10. It's when the Lord caused the sun to stand still. And it happened for an entire day. And the reason is that, that they, they, um, they were going to wipe out the Amalekites. But these five kings escape and they go off into the hills and they hide in caves. Joshua finds them and, and he captures them. And in verse 26 of Joshua 10, it says, And afterward, Joshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the trees until evening. Now, why did he hang them? Well, the reason was because they were enemies of God. Now, let me show you the second time. And we find that over in 2 Samuel chapter 18. Now, you're certainly familiar with this. You may not have been too familiar with that one in Joshua, but this one, you are. This one is about Absalom, who is David's son. And, and Absalom usurps the, uh, the, the, the kingdom. He takes the kingdom away from his father. And um, 
He was a traitor. He was a, a traitor and he took the kingdom from his father and David gets it back. And in 2 Samuel 18 and verse 9, Absalom is hung in a tree. Not intentionally, unintentionally. Listen, then Absalom met the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule. The mule went under the thick boughs of a great terebinth tree and his head caught in the terebinth. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth and the mule which was under him went on. It didn't kill him, but Joab does. Absalom is there hanging in this tree and he died. And he died because he was a traitor of the king. And then the third time we see this take place in the Old Testament is just a few chapters over in chapter 21 of 2 Samuel. And if, if you remember, Joshua had made a co covenant with the Gibeonites. And when he made that covenant, the covenant was that the Israelites would leave them alone. They would live in peace and, and the Hebrews and the Gibeonites would live together. But, but Saul came to the throne. He became king and in, in Saul's rashness and his craziness, he breaks that covenant and he slaughters a great number of these Gibeonites. He put them to death. So when David became king, the land was under a great drought, no rain. And David begins to cry out to the Lord to find out why. He needed to, to find out the Lord why the Lord was holding back the rain. And God tells him that it was because there were those who had broke the covenant with the Gibeonites. And so David took the ones who were involved in that and this is what it says in verse 9 of 2 Samuel chapter 21. Verse 9. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. They hung them on trees. And why did they hang them on trees? Because they had broke the covenant. Now, did you pick up on that, folks? Did, were you able to put those three things together? Those three Old, Old Testament crosses were those who had, first of all, become enemies of God. They were those who had been traitors to the king, and they were those who had broken the covenant. You see, the word of God tells us that you and I are under the curse, and cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Let me tell you something, folks. Every single one of us, each and every one of us, are guilty of all three of those things that they hung for in the Old Testament. You see, we are guilty of being enemies of God. And you say, well, Pastor, well, I'm not an enemy of God. Paul tells us in Colossians 1.21 that we are indeed enemies of God. But not only have we been enemies of God, but we have been a traitor to the king. We have turned our back on the king of kings and lord of lords. And time and again, we have broken that covenant between him and his people. You see, if there is anything, folks, that the cross has to reveal to us, that the cross teaches us, it is the curse of sin in our lives. But now here's the second thing. Not only the curse of sin in man's life, but the cure for man. The curse of sin and the cure for man. You see, it's that curse that I'm under that we need a cure for. So what's the cure? What's going to save me? What can I do about it? Well, now that I've got your attention, let me tell you. Let's go back to the verse. Verse 13, Galatians chapter 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Now, folks, <laughs> I need to do something here. And I, I chuckle because I, I know that those there are, are those who just kind of roll their eyes when I do this. But, but 
I need to show you something in the grammar. I need to show you something that's in the language, and I don't want you to miss it. It says, uh, in, in verse 10, one verse down, or I'm sorry, back in verse 10, it says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now, that's a, a, an English word. Under is an English word for the Greek word hupo. And um, it's just a four-letter Greek word, and it means to be under. I am under the curse of the law under the curse of sin, if you will, because there's sin in my life. I was born with a sin nature, but now let me tell you something. I am under the curse, and as a result, I am under judgment, under the wrath of God. And one day, one day, I need to pay for my sins. I will pay, you will pay, and right about now, you're saying, okay, pastor, this is Easter Sunday. I hope somehow this Easter message is going to get a little bit more encouraging. Well, it sure does, folks. It's about to get real encouraging because of what it says in the rest of verse 13. It says, having become a curse for us. You see, that word become in the English is another word in the Greek. It's the word uper. You see, we were under hupo, the curse, but Christ became uper, over the curse. You see, the weight of every sin, the weight of each and every sin was poured out on him that day 2,000 years ago. Now, it's real hard to sit still when you hear that, when you listen to that. It's real hard to sit still because we were under the curse, but he came over us. And the curse came to him instead of coming to us. We uh, come to him and he becomes over us. <coughs> Pardon me. That's what the cross reveals. The cross reveals that he came between me and the curse of sin. He came between me and the wrath and judgment of God. And Jesus invites us to come to him, to come under his protection because he takes it for those of us who have come to him. And that, folks, is the cure for that curse of sin in my life. That's the cure for my future. So the cross reveals the curse of sin. The cross reveals the cure for man. But I want you to see this. The cross also reveals the compassion of God. It says in verse 13, Christ has redeemed us. And we could stop right there. You know, we think about that. Redeemed is the word I want to focus on. You know, we, we, we talk about that, but we never really get the, 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 the real picture of it. Listen to the word, exagorazo. Exagorazo. Ex is out of. Agora is the marketplace. And that's literally what it means, is that Christ went down into the marketplace and he bought us out. He bought us out of where we were. You know, a couple of years ago, I had the, the privilege of going to Liberia to do a number of pastors' conferences in that country. And, and I don't know if you know anything about Liberia. It's a country on the West African coast. Um, and it was a country that was set up and given to uh, African Americans who were caught up in slavery. And uh, if they chose, they could go back to Africa. And there were a great deal of people that went back at that time. And they started a new life in what was what has become known as the country of, of, of Liberia. It's kind of, well, it's not kind of, it's between Sierra Leone and the Ivory Coast. And um, it had somewhat of a, a peaceful 
history until a man by the name of Samuel Doe came along who was uh, who took over in a military coup and he ushered in a decade of military rule. And then in 1989, another guy by the name of Charles Taylor came along and he launched a rebellion against Doe's regime. And there was a period of, of peace and then Again, civil war broke out and it ended up in Taylor being taken to The Hague and charged and going through a, a, a court for war crimes. But I tell you all of that to say this, that nation has had a cloud over it, just, just a darkness over it since they left the U.S. beginning in 1822. Right up until now, they've been, you know, under this cloud of bondage and slavery in their minds. You see, from the slave markets to the south, to the freedom of their own country, their own nation, and then back into bondage with a dictator, then a period of peace, and then back into bondage with a dictator. They went from freedom to bondage to freedom to bondage time and again, and it just left a cloud of darkness. There, there is a, an oppression there that you, you really have to go and, and see to believe until you meet a believer. And when you meet a believer, the difference is night and day. They have been set free, set free. You know, that bondage is where I was, where you were. When one day the Savior broke through the crowds and he came and he looked at that slave block and, and he, he saw me chained with chains of bondage and, and sin and owned by Satan. And the master looked and he said, I'll buy him. I'll buy him with my blood. Take those chains away. Put them on me. Put them on me. Put them here. You put me here and put him there. You see, the cross reveals to me a very compassionate, loving Heavenly Father who allowed his son to be under that curse for me, for me. That's what the cross reveals to me. You see, there weren't two thieves on the cross that day. There were actually three. There was one on either side of them, but the one in the center actually stole something that belonged to me. He took my sin. He, he took my place and he died for me. In 1864, the bloodiest battle of the Civil War took place in Franklin, Tennessee, a suburb of, of Nashville. And Chris and I have been to the museums there and, and there are three major museums and they're amazing. But what happened is that that was one of the bloodiest battles in all of the Civil War. And um, you can go there and go on these tours and, and, um, and, and learn that in less than three hours, there were more than 3,000 casualties. They say that there were so many casualties, there was no room for them to fall and they were dying, propping each other up. The Battle of Franklin was larger, longer, deadlier, bloodier, in the Battle of Gettysburg. All of the museums that you go and tour through there in Franklin have blood. These are houses that have been converted to makeshift hospitals during that battle. And there's furniture. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Tables and, 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 you know, places where they laid those, those injured, wounded soldiers and and blood on the floor and it's all still there that you can see but folks listen to me all of that blood the entirety of that blood in that battle that had had been lost that day has done absolutely no good for me whatsoever you see i don't need that blood i needed the blood of the savior because that's what changes me. One drop was all it took. 
one drop, and it conquered death, hell, and the grave. His blood allowed you and I to be seated with him in the heavenlies, and that's what the cross reveals. Let me pray. Again, Father, we, we rejoice that we can celebrate your resurrection. But Lord, we know that there's so much, so much that we have to learn of what that cross reveals, of what that cross brings, of what that cross is and does that allow us eternal life, that allow us to be seated in the heavenlies with you. But we thank you for this time that we can celebrate that all of that with you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, thank you, folks. Lord bless each and